We are continuing our series called Encounters with the Risen Christ with a look at today of Jesus appearing before his 11 original disciples as a group after he was resurrected. We've seen Mary's encounter with Christ, uh, the same with the disciples on their way to the Emmaus village. But the discussion that Jesus has with his original 11 is different from these two previous encounters. See, Jesus knows he only has a little bit of time before he must ascend back to heaven. And it reminds me a little bit of my own dad. When we first immigrated to Canada in the early 90s, my dad couldn't join us for the first two years. He had work commitments back in Malaysia, but he would visit us. And for as long as I can remember, we were the family who would arrive at the airport way in advance of a flight. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. Like if it, if boarding was at nine, we were at the airport from like 3 p.m. And I became used to going to wait with my dad in the terminal before his flight back to Malaysia. And we'd sit in the terminal talking with him for hours before he checked in. My dad would take his time and remind me and my brothers of things we need to do to support our mom around the house while he was away. And I would lounge on top of his suitcases on the trolley, just taking in the sound of his voice. I wasn't sure when I'd see him next or when he'd get leave off of work. And this memory, it really makes me picture in my mind, the disciples taking in Jesus' voice in one of their final conversations with him, simply glad that he wasn't dead, that he was among them. And I also imagine Jesus just relishing this chance to impart his wisdom and last thoughts to his beloved followers before he left them for reals this time. This encounter between the resurrected Christ and his original 11 are recorded in all four synoptic gospels in different ways. But I noticed two specific things. There's one message of Jesus repeated in all four gospel accounts and one really unique message of Jesus only mentioned in one of the four books. So let's start with what's shared. What does Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 have in common? Every one of these four books go out of their way to emphasize that Jesus' main crew, the original 11, as well as some of the large group who were with them, lacked faith. This group who approximately for three years walked the closest with Jesus, but they in fact doubted Jesus' own words, prophesying what would happen, that the Messiah would need to die in order to become the sin offering for the world, but he would be raised back to life. And I love Luke. He just hammers it in like bullet points. The disciples didn't listen to Mary or the women who first saw the resurrected Jesus. The disciples, again, didn't listen to the two who encountered Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Jesus had to pull a third maneuver and appeared before them in person saying, do you believe me now? So Jesus' own believers lacked faith. Remember how I mentioned that there was something peculiar? Now out of all the gospels, it was John who records a very unique conversation that Jesus had with his disciples that we don't see in any other gospel retelling. In John 20, beginning at verse 19, the risen Christ reinforced something so important, so necessary to relationship with God, that it was forgiving the sins of others. We know the writer John is so intentional in underscoring the importance of God's Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And the breadcrumb of a connection that God leaves for us here is so humbling. Check it out. Don't miss it. In order for his disciples to receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, to be empowered to have their spirits further awakened by the baptism of the Spirit of the living God, Jesus knew their hearts needed a tune-up. And God's not wrong. How our daddy knows us. Think of all the disciples had been through. They had to live through and witness their Messiah taken away, wrongly accused, beaten, and finally murdered. I think it's fair to say they needed a good counseling session to deal with all their resentment. And before you start thinking, Sarah, I know all this. No, take a good look at the scene with you in the picture and see how it applies. Second Timothy three verse 16 says, all scripture 
is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training up righteousness so that the servant of God may be found righteous. And that's absolutely true because God himself inspired these passages with us in mind. 2,000 plus years later and everyone to come in the future to reassure us that, yeah, you will experience hardship like you've never seen. You will come face to face with doubt in your walk of faith and the choice to release people from past or present hurt. With the crazy and almost unbelievable events of today around the world, do you know anyone who's struggling with their faith and finding it hard to let go and forgive? Look at the disciples. I think they looked around at the crazy mob around them, going just out of their minds, calling for Jesus' death. And they thought to themselves, what is this world coming to? They might have even known someone in the crowd participating in the frenzy and felt, how could they? I know it can feel like a challenge to get out of bed in these days. The racial prejudice, variants of COVID, businesses foreclosing. You check your online newsfeed and it's almost like you see just devastation after devastation. But just because you experience doubt in your faith, it doesn't mean that Jesus isn't alive or that God has given up on you. He wants to fill you in on his purposes with direction for each day of your life. The hard questions we all face is, are, are we going to face him each day? And have we forgiven others? Could I even go a step further to say that forgiveness is necessary on a daily basis? And I just want to clarify what unforgiveness is from a biblical standpoint. To deliberately hold on to your anger and withhold your release of that person from that event or circumstance. I hate the fact that there are times in my life where I feel like I'm the queen of holding on to a grudge. You say the Bible says God's idea of love is one that never keeps a record of wrongs. Well, I can keep a good record. And that it always hopes and trusts. Nope, I once thought that once a bridge was burned, it was easier left burned than repairing. And I'm ashamed of these things. But we cannot hope to be useful for the kingdom if we are unwilling to let go of hurt from the past. The Bible reiterates this so many times and in so many ways, even to warn us that unforgiveness could have physical repercussions on our health. Just look at the Psalms. Going through unforgiveness doesn't disqualify you from being used for kingdom purposes. Please hear this. He will restore all those moments of ugliness and, and bring healing to you. Your story is part of God's larger story for all time. Don't let unforgiveness create a foothold for the enemy. If you need help with tackling unforgiveness or, or just talking about it, we have some pastoral counseling and we have a prayer room available right after this at 7.30. Don't miss it out. The Zoom link will be below. Hope to catch you there. God bless you. Let's deal with this. Let's get anger and forgiveness and even doubt. Let's just get it right out of our lives. See you then.